Hello, I am Dr. Adam Dunstan, as always, and the topic for today is Saving Wildlife, Basics of Biodiversity and Complexities of Conservation, a topic near and dear to my heart since my days as an eight-year-old kid wearing many wolf t-shirts and writing to every senator and president he could think of about the importance of saving wolf species. So I've always cared about wildlife. Um, I almost went into a career as a wildlife biologist, started training for it and everything. And so, you know, it's a topic near and dear to my heart. I think it's a topic near and dear to many of our hearts. And indeed, for many cultures, um, some wildlife species are what we would call cultural keystone species, species that um, are fundamental to the culture. And so wildlife conservation is an important topic, and it's one I think uh, that anthropologists have some unique insights on that are worth talking about. You, uh, These are a couple of memes. I put them here partly because memes break up the flow of recorded lectures, making them less boring, and number two, because I like memes, and number three, because these particular memes have to do with misunderstandings of or odd translations of words or puns. For example, the term girlfriend implies the existence of a girl foe. This is a service I am willing to provide. <laughs> and then this one, have you ever wondered why it's called the Iliad? It's about Troy, and then the story of. This means that if you translated the title, the Iliad should actually be called Troy Story. Um, you know, these are at least borderline funny. Maybe you don't find them funny. They at least made me, you know, smile. Um, but as we'll see, words matter a great deal when it become when it comes to wildlife species. What does it mean to say that something is a species? What does it mean to say biodiversity? What is a wild animal versus a captive animal? And is that an important distinction? What does it mean to save a species? When is a species, quote, endangered with all of the legal protec protections that that tends to entail? So um, words matter a great deal when it comes to saving wildlife. And it is precisely in that way, among many others, that I think a social science or a cultural perspective is very helpful. But before we get too much deeper, let's talk about basics of biodiversity. It's a bit of a boring section. I was trying to make it more exciting, so I used like different colored text, like, woo, you've never seen this before. Um, I ended up with red and blue, I didn't mean to make the, and then like a white background. So it's like, it's like I'm doing like an American flag thing or something. That wasn't really the intention. Um, the U S isn't known for like unusually high levels of biodiversity or anything anyways. Okay. So, um, biodiversity though, what do we mean by that term? Uh, obviously if you look at just the term itself, the diversity of life, but that can mean a lot of different things. Conservation scientists, use environmental professionals, we usually break it apart into three different levels, um, all of which are important, all of which are threatened by humans to one degree or another. The one that tends to get the most focus in everyday conservation, or sorry, in everyday conversation for people that are not conservationists or scientists tends to be species biodiversity, right? We say things like save the gray wolf um, or talk about saving um, the endangered pilot whale, right? We build political campaigns around that. We have laws like the Endangered Species Act or comparable laws in many other countries um, which specifically focus on preserving populations of a species, right? So that there's a lot of focus on species biodiversity. And that makes sense, right? That's something we can sort of easily visually distinguish in a way we cannot with, let's say, genetic diversity. Um, species biodiversity, though, what do we mean by a species? Uh, a species is a mostly clear-cut term, but occasionally not. So the idea idea of a species is a group of organisms closely enough similar to each other uh, that they can reproduce with each other. And importantly, reproduce over multiple generations, reproduce fertile offspring, because for example, a horse and a donkey can reproduce and produce a mule, um, but a mule is not a new species, well, a mule is not a fertile species, right? The 
line ends there. And so there's a variety of species like that where they're close enough to procreate they're not close enough to actually like develop into a new species of hybrids or something that self perpetuates. So generally speaking, then a species, at least when we're talking about animals and plants and so forth, is a species that the population is self-sustaining in the sense of it can reproduce the next generation. Um, and it's closely related genetically then. So that's the idea of a species. And of course, there are things like subspecies. A subspecies um, would, by definition, be they could still interbreed, but subtle differences, right? Something like an Arctic wolf um, and a timber wolf from further down into Canada, uh, different coloration and things like that. There's also genetic biodiversity. Genetic biodiversity is probably the one people probably think the least about in sort of everyday conversation, but is really important, be partly because it has such a huge effect on everything else. So the idea there is we want, uh, generally speaking, wildlife professionals understand that it's important not just to keep a certain number of a species alive, but to make sure that we have a significant amount of different genes in that population, right? Not just for an extreme example, one family of snow leopards or something, right? We want to make sure it's multiple different families um, because of the dangers of having a limited gene pool. Um, cheetahs are a good example of this. It's not solely because of human predation and human hunting and human caused issues, but cheetahs have gone through a population bottleneck where their gen genetics are extremely limited. Uh, that becomes obviously very problematic um, because a species with very limited genetics, among other things, is very susceptible to whatever random disease comes in. Um, having robust genetics means a species is more likely to survive the next random disease. Um, it is also, of course, the storehouse for evolution. It allows for evolution over the very long term. Um, also, in some species, too much close interbreeding causes recessive problems with excessive um, recessive genes and different things, mutations, stuff like that. It depends on um, the species, but it can cause issues. And so, for all of those reasons, right, we want a healthy genetic diversity of a species. Now, what's interesting, and we'll talk about this a bit more later, but is how closely that's managed, particularly in captive breeding programs in zoos. So zoos um, have what are called, many zoos have what are called, sorry, let me rephrase that. Many zoos are linked up with big zoo organizations like um, the AZA, for example. That's American Zoological Association, uh, but it, like partners between a bunch of different zoos and coordinates what are called um, SSPs or species survival plans and typically is part of a plan to breed a species in captivity and hopefully reintroduce it into the wild. Um, part of that is they really carefully track who's breeding with who and they have these things called stud books which are kind of exactly what they sound like, um, whether it's literally a book or not, but keeping track of who bred with who. And then um, oftentimes zoos will move around animals from one zoo to another, partly to kind of refresh the genetic stock, as it were. So genetic biodiversity is another important thing. And it's kind of, a, from an anthropologist's perspective, a really interesting example of the concept of biopolitics that we've talked about applied um, at a very nitty gritty level of controlling which animals breed with which animals in a captive setting to ensure genetic biodiversity, right? It is very much biopolitics in the Foucauldian sense, but applied um, at the level of animals rather than humans. A third type of biodiversity is ecosystem diversity. Ecosystem diversity um, is exactly what it sounds like, right? The diversity of different types of habitats, different types of assemblages of plants, animals, um, fungi, microorganisms, and abiotic entities. So um, we used to think of ecosystems, so that was a term that first started to get a lot of purchase, as we've talked about in the 40s, 50, really the 50s, the 60s, um, there was kind of the um, model of sort of an ecosystem is a tightly woven web of parts, a puzzle that if you take out pieces is going to fall apart. Um, more recent ecology, as we've 
come to better understand ecosystems, we understand that that's not precisely true in all cases, that many times it's more like kind of shifting ranges that overlap. Nonetheless, within that, right, so it's not just like five species that have to always coexist with each other necessarily, but generally speaking, any given chunk of land, we can distinguish between that and other chunks of land and notice some of the patterns and processes and like species that rely on each other and uh, rely on certain kinds of trees and so forth. So ecosystems are still a thing, even if they're a little more um, fuzzy than we used to think of them as. But ecosystem diversity is something where we would want to maintain ecosystem diversity, um, partly for all sorts of reasons, one of which is that ecosystems provide different kinds of ecosystem services. Um, there's a history in the US historically of at first thinking that swamps were kind of useless and draining swamps to make cities and draining swamps to make agricultural fields for the obvious reasons of making it easier to farm, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, it was in the later part of the 20th century that we came to fully understand just how valuable wetlands are, which we were calling swamps, but nowadays tend to call wetlands, because, among other things, they provide a lot of ecosystem services in the form of water filtration. They suck up a lot of crap, to be kind of blunt about it. Um, they also tend to be really important stopovers. Small little ponds and swamps and things tend to be really important stopovers for migratory birds and other wildlife. Um, they do other things as well. And uh, In places like Louisiana, um, swamps and other sorts of semi or sorry wetlands and other sorts of things near coastal areas can also act as important um, buffers for storm events and so you know ecosystem diversity matters from a human perspective ecosystem diversity also definitely matters from a species perspective right it stands to reason that ultimately having a diversity of this is fundamentally depending on having a diversity of this uh, if we're trying to save the panda and not trying to save their bamboo forests, we are really doing it backwards, right? Because you can't save a bunch of individuals and then have nowhere for the individuals to live. Or can you? We'll talk about that later. Uh, but that's basics of biodiversity. Let's talk now about species. How many are there? That should not read 1.2 to 1.5. That would be an extremely small number of species. It's like humans and then half of a dog species or something. Um, 1.2 to 1.5 million cataloged species. Those are species that scientists have identified and probably named. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot, a lot. And you'd be surprised how many are beetles. Um, the biodiversity that we know of is strongly skewed towards insects and we also know that there's a lot of insects that we don't know um, but there's a lot of beetles but there's also a lot of other things as well but 1.2 to 1.5 million species cataloged however it is estimated various different estimates but a com one estimate you'll hear is that there may be 8.7 million different species on our planet and that's not really counting like microorganisms like bacteria and things like that um, so well true true like I should say bacterial organisms and viruses and things like that um, but up to 7.7 .7 million animals actually that's pretty freaking incredible um, how why is there a distinction between the species we know and then how can we make an estimate like that there's a number of reasons but the Biggest one is because most of the biodiversity of the world's tropical rainforest have thus far not been cataloged. Uh, places like the Amazon, certain parts of Southeast Asia, certain parts of equatorial Africa. And so in those tropical rainforests, you have large swaths of land um, where there's really, really rich biodiversity. The tropics, the equatorial areas, tend to be, in general, really biodiverse. Um, more warmth, uh, more moisture in a tropical rainforest, the kind of stuff that life likes. And so as a result, um, we have lots and lots and lots of species in tropical rainforests. And there's also an extremely high rate of endemism. Um, and small ranges, what I mean by that is like species that are only found in a tiny little area, um, and also again very high biodiversity. The effect of that is that we can do studies, and scientists have done studies like this, where you go out into a spot of tropical rainforest and, this is kind of sad, but essentially gas like an acre of land, um, 
you know, kill or neutralize any bugs in the area and other organisms, and then count up the number of species and how many were known species and how many were unknown species. And what they find as they do that is that, at least when they were doing the studies in like the 80s, 90s, is that it was like 90% of the species they tended to not know in an acre of rainforest or a hectare of rainforest. So you extrapolate that out over the amount of rainforest we have in the world, and it gives you a number of species we don't know yet, but we're pretty sure are there, that if we kept cataloging, we'd find X amount of species in the Amazon, that we'd find X amount of species in the Congo. And so the estimate then overall is 8.7 million species, which is pretty incredible. The fact that we don't know how many, or don't know most of those species is a pretty compelling argument that some people make for conservation. Among others, um, the idea that there may be plants with medicinal properties or animals with medicinal properties that we have not yet discovered and could be very helpful for diseases. So that's a little bit about species. Um, ecosystems, as we said, are increasingly a focus as well for ecosystem services. And because pr by protecting ecosystems, you protect entire assemblages of animals that live within that. You protect, you make sure you protect the very small amount of long grass prairie left in the United States, and you've protected a bunch of species that tend to be in long grass prairies. You protect um, Pacific Northwest coastal rainforest, which has its own threats, and you protect all sorts of animals that live within that space, right? So there's been a kind of a shift in the last 30 years, arguably, towards a more like land focus and ecosystem focus in conservation work. Um, and you're seeing that more in like the government conservation world, kind of a more heavy focus. I mean, that's always been there with like the land agencies, but kind of a more heavy focus, especially among like private environmental NGOs of thinking of this, not as, you know, a save the pilot whale campaign, but a save the X biosphere campaign, right? That if we can buy up or protect certain amounts of land uh, or make sure that they're non-extractive, economies built around those pieces of land that we can save a whole lot of species all at once. So ecosystems. You've probably heard the concept of a sixth mass extinction. Um, this is a graphic from the IUCN, which is one of our major, major environmental NGOs that does some of our best data tracking on endangered species across the world, compiling data from all the different countries, which is no easy task since they may sometimes assess the data differently and have different types of programs in some countries, may not have very active conservation um, science infrastructure as much as others. But in any case, IUCN compiles all of it for something called the IUCN Red List. IUCN Red List is a, is a great um, site that you should definitely go to sometime. They publish reports regularly of what's going on with different species uh, and across genera, by which I mean, or taxa across like entire categories. So for example, here's mammals. Um, we've looked at about 85% of the known mammals as far as from a to figure out what their population looks at of those about 24 percent right so about one in four mammals is endangered or threatened in some way um, or vulnerable birds we've estimated essentially all birds birds are really a lot easier than most species to keep track of and because of nerdy bird watchers like your professor we've identified most of them and 13 percent of those have been assessed um, amphibians only about two-thirds have been assessed this these numbers are a bit old but still mostly true the number now is more like 35 percent as we talked about last week uh, this is some other species as you can see um, some species or some taxa, I should say, some big categories of species, we know very little of what's going on because we know very little about the taxa itself. So arachnids, spiders, among many other things, it is estimated that we know about 0.02% of them. Yeah, <gasps> scary. Is that why so many spiders crawl into our mouths when we're sleeping at night, according to that old tale? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I think it has more to do with the fact that there's a tremendous amount of um, arachnids and insects in... Um, what's it called? In that we don't keep very good track of. So sorry, I should clarify. This isn't not known. It's not assessed. So it's not something where we have a good sense of what the population is. Uh, try to do wildlife biology with spiders. It's pretty tricky. Some things 
have not been very well cataloged as all, as you can see in terms of where they sit conservation-wise, which raises a really important point then, right? When we talk about statistics about um, conservation and which types of organisms are the most endangered, we have to understand that sometimes, like with birds, we have really good knowledge. And sometimes, like with flowering plants, we have really bad knowledge, or mushrooms, we have very poor knowledge of what's going on. But it doesn't mean the biodiversity is not important, right? Fungi perform incredibly important roles in ecosystems as decomposers. And so um, there's a degree to which we're dealing with the problems of production of knowledge and where we have focused our efforts historically as well as what's easier to look at, right? And to find and to track. Um, there's, an, there's a tendency for bigger species, among other things, for us to be more interested in and be easier to track and have more data about. Uh, it's pretty rare that we find a new large species. It is extremely common, like all the time, that we find um, new small species. And when you do hear about a new big species being discovered, it's often sort of the headlines a little misleading because it's often that we, one species we'd now figured out were actually two species that happened with um, orangutans a while back. So extinction rates, though. Um, we can talk about the background rate versus the anthropogenic rate. So background rate is something we estimate, among other things, by looking at the fossil record. Is that a perfect way to estimate how extinction rates have been historically? By no means. A whole lot of speculation and assumptions going into that. Uh, having said that, that is the available method, essentially, right? So we look at the rate at which um, basically fossil species drop out of the record. And one of the things we note is that there have been uh, five major extinction events, right? Uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs being the best known. And then, of course, we would arguably be in a sixth mass extinction. What we mean by mass extinction is the idea of way, way, way more extinctions happening way, way more rapidly than they normally do. Because extinction by itself is not necessarily a bad thing. That's a normal part of life, right? Natural selection, um, survival of the fittest, all that. There's a certain amount of background extinction rates. Uh, is it something like one species in 100 years or one species in 10 years? It's, it's quite slow. But the anthropogenic, I think it's one in a hundred, but the anthropogenic rate is much faster than that. What I mean by that is the rate since the Industrial Revolution, since we've been tracking these sorts of things. You'll hear estimates of, oh, one species every minute, or you'll hear estimates of 150 to 200 a day. That's based on back to the rainforest, our estimates of how many species, many of them small insect species, but other things as well are in the rainforest undiscovered and how quickly we're cutting the rainforest. So that's very much an estimated rate. So if you've ever had like an anxiety attack, like I almost do, uh, thinking about that, those kind of numbers do bear in mind that they are estimates. Um, and the number of known species that have gone extinct, things like 134 birds, 79 mammals, 68 fish. So far less serious sounding if you think of it from that perspective but still incredibly serious, right? If we compare that to the background extinction rate, that's incredibly rapid. Um, even if we ignore what's probably going on, we just can't fully measure it, and only looking at extinctions that we are 100% for sure about, um, it very, very rapid rate, right? So we need one, you know, more than one being lost a year. That's a lot faster um, than what happened historically. And so that's a big concern. That's obviously a really big concern. Um, one point I also wanted to make at some point, and I guess here's as far as good of a place to bring it up as any, is the concept of what we culturally value and focus on when we think about extinction. Um, if I tell you that 150 charismatic megafauna were dying, were probably dying a day versus 150 bugs, we might have very different reactions. Most people do. Or even if I said 150 megafauna and 150 type, various types of rodents. So what do I mean by, by megafauna? So charismatic megafauna is a term that we use for the idea that human beings um, like to focus our efforts on saving species that are beautiful and that we can see because they're big enough to be seen. Um, so things like tigers, things like wolves, things like California condors. California condors have received hundreds of thousands, 
upon hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, in their conservation. Um, and as a result, we were able to bring the California condor back from extinction, which is fantastic. Having said that, um, there are hundreds of bird species on, um, that are very not well known by the general public in Hawaii that are currently um, facing severe problems because of, among other things, habitat development and invasive species on the Hawaii, on the Hawaiian islands. And so uh, we have a tendency to kind of be blinded by the light of charismatic megafauna. So anyways, so if I'm saying 150 insects are and other small critters are probably going extinct in the Amazon every day, um, you might say, well, does anybody really care to be overly blunt about it? And you know, that's a complex question. Ultimately, that's a scientific question, but it's also a cultural question. What is it that we're trying to preserve when we say we want to save species? Are we wanting to save species that we can see because we enjoy seeing them? Are we wanting to save species that have widespread and obvious ecological functions that if you get rid of have big effects? You know, you get rid of a wolf and suddenly um, the, pre the hooved species start acting differently, which changes the vegetation patterns, which changes the course of rivers in the Yellowstone National Park. And then you put the wolves back and the rivers start acting the way they're supposed to as the willows regrow because the her herbivorous animals are, hang are hanging out in different spots because they're trying to avoid the wolves. We sometimes call those, of course, keystone species, right? Species that are like a keystone that you remove it and things start to fall apart. So is that what we're trying to preserve or every single species? Um, for folks that do want to preserve every single species, sometimes it's from the grounds of what we call the precautionary principle. The idea that we should not get rid of anything that we don't understand what it does in an ecosystem, right? We don't necessarily know all the necessary species in an ecosystem. We shouldn't tinker. Other people come at it more from an a priori moralistic viewpoint, by which I mean the idea uh, that we should not get rid of a single species if we can avoid it because it is morally intrinsically wrong for one species, Homo sapien, uh, to decide on the life of another species that evolution has produced or that a divine creator has produced or whatever your particular perspective. Um, so some people come at it from that perspective. It's an interesting argument about where we focus our funds because we don't have sort of unlimited funds in the conservation world. You spend any time at all with conservation NGOs, with fish and game, with fish and wildlife, and you'll realize we're working in a situation where we have somewhat limited funds and time and public attention. So where do we focus efforts? It's an interesting question. All right, let's talk now a little bit about causes of extinction. And to talk about that, we'll talk about hippo. By that, I don't mean adorable hippos, like this little guy, uh, but I mean instead an acronym that gets used in the conservation world to talk about different causes of extinction. And they are arguably roughly ordered in, ter in rate of seriousness. Um, but all are important. These are kind of our five biggest causes of species extinction. Makes for a useful and easy acronym to remember them. Habitat loss. H for habitat loss, I for invasive species, P for pollution, P for population growth, meaning human population growth, um, That because that obviously contributes to a lot of the other things, right? More humans, more pollution. Counter arguments to that include more humans, um, potentially future humans have better pollution technologies, but the argument would be that overall population growth contributes to other things. Uh, and then O for over harvesting, which would mean poaching, right? Illegally hunting protected animals, but all sorts of other things as well, right? Just the very fact that um, I say bush meat here, what I'm talking about is that we have a, that there are sometimes um, still commodity wildlife markets in certain parts of sub-Saharan Africa, um, in certain parts, sorry, of equatorial Africa, in certain parts of Southeast and East Asia, and a variety of other places as well, but basically places where you have wild meat being served like at a market and where it's unclear sometimes what the species is and sometimes species end up getting hunted for that um, that are not, uh, that are conservation weak, uh, that are endangered. So it's not sort of the kind of like poaching for ivory to make a bit you know, thousands of dollars that we sometimes tend to think of. Uh, it's 
people trying to put literally food on the table, but in the as a result of that, sometimes endangered species. Um, bycatch, right, when a big issue here in Alaska, um, species other than the species that's trying to be fished, getting caught up by trawlers and different things. Uh, that's a big issue, obviously, among other things, because it's one thing to tightly monitor, let's say, the halibut population or the salmon populations or different things, but we're oftentimes n not <laughs> as carefully... Um, regulating certain other kinds of fish, but then they're getting caught up by trawlers, right? And so that can be a big issue. Um, it can also, overharvesting can also refer to like logging too much, right? Or um, just overfishing a species. So it doesn't have to be, so I know, so this is kind of where culture comes into play, right? When we talk about overharvest of a species, we oftentimes think of like, oh, the person in Southeast Asia or in Southern Africa or in Mozambique going and killing a rhino to sell the ivory definitely a big concern for some of our charismatic megafauna, uh, but there are other things that are a lot more common uh, causes of overharvesting. So, you know, we have these cultural narratives, partly based on the entertainment we have, the discourses, the things we've seen in TV shows and different things that cause us to over-focus on certain problems for animals and plants and not focus enough on other problems. In fact, over-harvesting as a whole, although it's a big problem for certain species, including some of our Alaska species like salmon, um, by far the biggest problem for problems for species are these two, and especially this one. So invasive species, um, species that displace other species when they move into an area, um, typically brought about because of, you know, human activity usually at sometimes intentional, like the genius that decided to release starlings so that the United States would have um, all uh, allegedly so that the United States would have all of the different birds mentioned in Shakespearean plays. And now we have starlings, which are a major problem in a variety of parts of the lower 48. Um, as well as things that are accidental, for example, because they've stowed away on boats. So things like um, invasive species, for example. Um, and so, but habitat, so things like zebra mussels, things like other kinds of species. Habitat loss, though, is our biggest factor. It really, really is. And as we've talked about before, about 80% of human land use is for food. The remaining 20% is for other things, and that includes um, managed logging and things like that, But and then also um, cities and suburban sprawl and stuff like that. So if we're talking about how to save species, um, maybe it's just because I grew up in the 90s, but we tend to go towards, like, oh, let's think about... Um, poaching, right, and stopping poachers, or let's think about sort of commercial commercial ship, whaling ships way out in the Pacific or something. Um, and yeah, those are things to think about, but I think there's, there's an easy sort of moral economy going on there, as we like to say sometimes, right, a way in which we're sort of shifting blame um, and complicity out onto other groups and not realizing the very real way in which, as an example, in certain parts of the lower 48, um, you know, having urban and suburban sprawl out into areas that formerly were long grass prairie, right? I'm thinking of North Texas, where I used to live, um, the very real effects that that has on species that, you know, people aren't thinking when they, you know, buy a big plot of, buy a big plot of land and build a house there and put up a big artificial lawn, like, oh, I'm destroying species right now, right? But those things have effect um, on the aggregate when you put them all together. Um, a poacher uh, killing a rhino is a very visible thing, um, but a, so a new suburban housing development um, that's massive in what used to be tall grass prairie tends to get a lot less attention as an environmental issue. So again, cultural issues that frame how we see um, what are major problems for species and sometimes cause us to not realize that some of our biggest impacts are things that you and I can control, right? Um, as an example, using less palm oil, given the effects it has on things like orangutan species, not to mention indigenous groups, as we've talked about. As another example, uh, many people have argued that one of the best things you can do for your for wildlife species would be um, to eat vegetarian or vegan. Uh, I am not vegetarian or vegan, but the argument there would be that it takes significantly less land base to live a vegetarian diet, and therefore um, less land needing to be developed, more land available for animals, less habitat loss, less species extinction. Uh, you know, here in Alaska, it's kind of a very different game entirely since so much of our meat is wild caught, right? That argument of sort of veganism is more environmentally sustainable has a lot to do with 
the assumption that people are getting their meat from uh, industrial farming operations, which obviously here in Alaska, a lot of times it's wild caught meat as well, which is different, right? If we're trying to measure the environmental impact of wild meat, that's a very different animal than um, commercially raised animals. All right, so culture all the way down, as it always is. And speaking of cultural things, another cultural dimension of all of this is why preserve biodiversity? Um, so we've talked about, you know, tiny little species that people may not know about, right? Or very small rodent species or different things. It doesn't matter if it's not something that people, you know, line up as tourists to go see and get into a, you know, a helicopter to go see bears or something. If it's some tiny little rodent that nobody really ever notices, doesn't matter. Why preserve biodiversity, especially when it's not something that seems to have a direct benefit for human tourism or human economy. There's a lot of ways to argue about for and against that case. Um, one of the ones that often gets brought up, and certainly one that anthropologists would bring up, because a lot of because of how many anthropologists have worked in the field of ethnomedicine or local forms of healing, is the importance of medicinal plants. Indigenous groups the world over uh, have used since time immemorial, really, um, species wild species for medicinal needs, and not only that, but many of our medicines, in one way or another, have come out of wild plants, out of either directly using wild plants, growing plants or um, synthesizing compounds from a plant, but we would not have known how to make the compound if not for the plant that we found it in. Um, in fact, there's a certain amount of big business in pharmaceutical companies hiring people um, for what is sometimes called bioprospecting. That's kind of a, um, it's a negative characterization. You probably wouldn't find a pharmaceutical company calling it that, but basically going into indigenous communities in places like the Amazon, uh, learning about how people use medicinal plants and then starting to harvest them or either directly for use in a medicine or just as often, if not more often, to harvest them so that you can take them back to the lab so that you can figure out what the compound is that people have been using for traditional medicine all these years. Uh, there are all sorts of ethical issues with that, one of which is over-harvesting of a plant that indigenous people have been using, um, another which can happen, another of which is do indigenous people have intellectual property right over essentially the, something that they discovered the use of and then a pharmaceutical company did some extra steps to make it into a pill form and is now making billions off of it while well, the indigenous community may remain highly impoverished. Um, all sorts of issues there. A complex one that definitely a lot of anthropologists have weighed in on. Nonetheless, um, stepping back from that a little bit, the vast majority of plants, we have never fully figured out what whether or not they have medicinal use, but we know that many of our medicines come from plants. 11% of the 252 World Health Organization Essential Medicines, this info is about 10 years old, um, up to 50% of the approved drugs from about... Um, 80 to 2010 were developed from plants in one way or another. Um, so just a tremendous, tremendous amount of potential for medicines. And so an argument for not, you know, cu cutting down or an argument for caring about, you know, random wildflower in um, sort of mountainous Chile that nobody really ever sees because nobody really goes up into a, this really high mountain area and you're like, what's the point? Um, an argument for conserving something like that would be, it may have a medicinal benefit, a tremendous medicinal benefit, right? Um, the, ne the, the cure for complex diseases that have challenged us for centuries uh, may be lurking in the Amazon, right? It's the world's pharmacy, as they sometimes say. So it's a pretty compelling argument. I'll, um, another argument that's sometimes made is that we often don't understand the ecosystem dynamics and that when we start to simplify an ecosystem, which by that we mean cut out things we don't like, turn it into a, for example, where I'm from in the Pacific Northwest, uh, take forests that had a lot of different species and essentially turn them into a monocrop of Douglas fir after a logging operation in a reseeding um, that disturbed ecosystems tend to um, allow weeds to grow back more as well as pathogenic species, um, species, um, insects that carry pathogens, um, things like that. So all sorts of um, concerns for things like zoonotic diseases when we start to destroy or simplify ecosystems, right? We've removed the forest around a wetland that had a bunch of mosquitoes that have yucky virus number a thousand that we don't even know about yet. Um, and then we've talked about charismatic megafauna 
so we don't really need to talk about that again, but basically that many uh, some of our most threatened bodies of species are ones that people don't know a ton about but don't get a lot of attention. We call that taxonomic chauvinism is a term you'll sometimes hear. Sounds you, makes you sound real fancy at a party. All right, and that's about it for talking about some of sort of the basic mm, statistics and ideas behind biodiversity. I'd like to shift now to talking about complexities of conservation.